Hi, today we're going to do rum. Now we've done a number of videos on fermentation and distillation, in other words, practical chemistry. But we're gonna kick things up a notch by making a more sophisticated spirit when we make rum. Now rum has some similarities to rye and bourbon and whiskey in that it too is synthesized from the fermentation of a grass or a grain. But it probably has more in common with Japanese sake than it does with these other spirits. Firstly, both the rice that makes sake and the sugarcane that makes the molasses from which you make the rum, both grow in hot, humid, tropical conditions and first originated in Southeast Asia thousands of years ago. With the advent of agriculture and migration, it tended to move westward into the Levant, that's Turkey and North Africa, and with the Polynesians moved into the South Pacific Islands. Hundreds of years ago, it was discovered though that one of the premier locations for growing sugarcane was in the Caribbean islands. And because it is such an easy crop to grow, it grows very quickly. And it's also very easy to extract the water soluble sugars by simply macerating and grinding up the sugarcane, boiling it, extracting the sucrose in a liquid and then boiling it down to a sweet syrup, which is then let outside to dry, crystallize, and then crunched up and put into barrels. They could then send this to both North America and to Europe. It was very popular. And the ships that left Europe left empty with a lot of cash. And so what they would do is they would end up going to North Africa, picking up slaves, and the slaves were then sent back to the Caribbean to man the plantations. This is a sinister part of the history of rum in that it probably was one of the major reasons for the continuation of the Atlantic slave trade. Nevertheless, when the rum was generated, it was generated as a byproduct. When you take the sugar syrup and remove it, you're left with a residual sticky, thick material, which is molasses. And just like with potatoes, where most of the flavor and the minerals is located in the skin, most of the flavor in the minerals in sugarcane is left behind in the very, very sweet smelling molasses. Now, when you do a first extraction, you do that first boiling, you end up with a relatively lightly flavored sweet liquid called first pass or first run molasses. This is a very common variety called Grandma's and it's sold all over the US in, in small bottles. But if you then take that first pass and you store it in barrels or some container, and build up enough of it that you can then re-synthesize uh, or re-boil it down to extract a little bit more value, a little more sugar, you create what's called blackstrap molasses. This is an excellent molasses for making rum. It's cheaper than the grandma's. It's about $22 a bottle for about four liters. And it is much stickier, has more flavor, as well as the fact that both of these are unsulfured. What happens is when you, when you take sugarcane and you harvest it a little bit early, it can rot. And so what they'll do is they'll take sulfur dioxide and add it to the crop before they make the molasses. And that will help to preserve the molasses. The problem is it adds additional sulfur. And as we get into with distillation, we don't want sulfur. We do everything we can to remove it. So you don't want to get a molasses that's already had an artificial addition of sulfur. You want unsulfured blackstrap molasses. Now, the process of making the molasses involved taking the, uh, the final liquids that were finally produced, the final uh, molasses, and either disposing of it, throwing it in the ocean, or storing it, getting rid of it, because it didn't have a lot of financial value. But because of the hot, humid conditions down in the Caribbean, natural yeasts would begin to inoculate this stored, thick molasses. And what would happen is it would begin to ferment. And as people have done for thousands of years, when stuff ferments, it generates alcohol and some clever person, whether it was a slave or a plantation owner, decided to distill it to extract the first rum. 
Now that first rum was considered a very low quality beverage. It was harsh, it didn't have a lot of flavors, but because they could make so much of it, there was so much sugar and molasses that was generated in the sugar trade, they had a lot of it and booze is booze. And because they were making so much of it, it was being shipped all over the world. And despite its low quality, it was easily available to the sailors that were shipping it. And it became a very popular beverage with sailors to the point that nowadays you really can't think of rum without thinking of, of sailors, of sailing, you know, pirate. Over time though, the beverage improved in flavor. And part of the reason that was is not just because of the improvement in the brewer's skills, but because what happened was that when you do a fermentation, you have a leftover of the wash, the solids at the bottom. That contains some yeast as well as some residual alcohol and sugar. And when you do a distillation, the byproduct, what's left over, which is called stillage, also contains flavor and alcohol and a little bit of sugar. And so rather than throwing this material away, what they would do is they would store it with the idea being that they could later add this back into the process to pull a little more alcohol and a little bit more money out of the process. Well, while it sat in these pits and these barrels, it would become ever thicker and nastier and more complicated as, the, as it was inoculated with wild yeast and bacterias. There were bacteria such as Streptococcus, uh, Lactobacillus, uh, Aspergillus, uh, Acetobacter, and all of these different, uh, different kinds of bacteria would create different kinds of byproducts, which when added into the rum created the final flavor. Now you might think that's pretty nasty. We're gonna take bacteria and we're gonna put it into the final product. You don't have to worry about that because when they do a distillation, you're essentially taking boiling liquid and then boiling hot alcohol vapor that runs through the system. No biologicals are gonna survive that, but the chemicals they produce will. Now you might think, nah, those chemicals may themselves not be all that desirable. I mean, acetobacter is what makes vinegar and the uh, strep doesn't always produce just sore throat. The strep thermophiles actually produces yogurt from milk. You produce some interesting compounds. You get butyric acid. Now, you might think acetic acid would be a nasty thing to put into a beverage, but because of the wonders of chemistry, when you add ethanol to acetic acid, you get ethyl acetate, which has a tropical fruity type of smell. When you take butyric acid, which is the same stuff that the Whale Wars guys threw at the whaling ships because it smells like vomit. The butyric acid is just uh, putrefied butter. It's not really dangerous, but it does stink a lot. When you mix that with ethyl alcohol, you get ethyl butyrate, which tastes and smells like pineapple. So it's pretty interesting what's happening there. Now, when you make your first rum, you can think of that as sort of a practice rum, but it's also the means by which you're going to make your first batch of dunder, which is then gonna be used to make the more complex and mature rum. Now, what I have over here is some dunder left over from a previous process that's about four months old. And what I did is I placed a little bit of cheesecloth over the top of this just to keep insects out, but it had access to the environment. And so if you look inside of here, you see that it looks pretty nasty, but it actually smells remarkable. It has sort of a coffee, um, allspice, uh, tobacco kind of aroma. It's, it's pretty interesting. And when we add this into the system, it's going to transfer some of those flavors into the more mature rum. Now, a lot of people, when they add this dunder in, they're kind of squeamish. And so what they'll do is they'll just end up putting this into the still and take whatever kind of acids or material that had been generated in the bucket over the last couple of months. Other people will be a little more daring and what they'll do is most of the way through a fermentation near the end, they'll add this in and give it an opportunity to do a little bit of, of activity on the fermented beverage. I tend to be kind of daring and I just put this in right at the beginning, giving it the greatest amount of opportunity to deal with the sugar along with an overwhelming load of brewer's yeast. And it works, it gives you a very interesting flavor. It's much different than the first rum that you'll ever make. Now, the process of making the rum involves 
knowing a little bit about how to do a fermentation. And I'm going to assume at this point you know nothing. So the first thing that you have to do is you have to select a vessel in order to be able to do the fermentation. And a lot of people starting out will start out with these things called carboys, which are those tapered glass jugs that have the tapered nozzle that you invert into a water cooler. Those things are popular because you can put little seals at the top of them with a little bubbler and they seal off very well. I really don't like them because first of all, they're fragile and they're glass and they can get slippery and they can weigh as much as 25 to 30 kilograms when fully filled up. But more important than that, they are extremely difficult to clean out because when you have this tiny little nozzle, once you've got the material that you try to remove from there, you want to clean it out. You've got to use these weird shaped brushes to try to get in there. It's not worth it. A much better way to do a fermentation is to simply use a stainless steel pot. You can get these as stock pots. You can get them for doing, say, fried turkey. You can get them in large sizes in stainless steel, and they have the obvious advantage that they're very easy to clean. They also have another advantage for any kind of a fermentation where you're going to be boiling a mash or you're going to be heating the contents before the fermentation. Because you can heat them in the pot, then you can ferment them in the same pot. It saves a step, it saves time, but it also means that you've got less opportunity for contamination to occur. So it has a double advantage. Now, if you want to kick this up a notch, what you can do is you can get to a uh, specifically uh, purpose-made uh, vessel for doing this. This is a very high quality, uh, what is it, 60 liter, 15 gallon pot out of stainless steel made by Anvil, very well made. And it has a few advantages that make this really nice when you're doing a fermentation. One of them is, if you look inside here, I'll try to make this a little more obvious, is that it has little marks that have been etched in here for volume. This makes it easy that when you're adding different components, water and other products, you don't have to be um, weighing or measuring the volumes ahead of time. You can sort of add the materials and see how you're doing. It can save a little bit of time. In addition, this comes with an analog thermometer that's placed on the front here. This is probably the least valuable addition to this, simply because most of the stuff that I do uses digital thermometers. And so this is just sort of a backup. But the most valuable component is this port located down here with a valve. When I started doing fermentations, when you're done with the fermentation, you have to get the stuff out of the, the container. And often what you would end up doing is taking a flexible tube like this, you'd put one end in here, you'd suck on the other end, and then you'd dump it into either bottles if you're doing beer, or you'd put it into a distillation still, or you'd put it into some sort of transfer vessel. The point is though, it's messy. This thing gets sticky. In order to turn it off, you have to kind of hold it up. It drips all over the place. And secondly, it also means that when you're putting this thing in here, you're churning up the liquid. And as you're lowering it down further and further, as you're getting out near the bottom, you're creating turbulence inside, which tends to mix up all of the debris that's on the bottom of the container. That debris, if it gets into your still, can lead to scorching and can lead to foaming. So it's not desirable. What's nice about this little valve here is you just put the tube on the end here. You open it up to fill your vessel. You close it when you want to stop. And if you look inside, I'll try to hold this down so you get kind of a good view of it. If you look inside here, you'll see that there is this little port down here with this right angle fitting. And that fitting can be adjusted to aim all the way down at the bottom if you want to get every last drop of liquid out of there. Or if you want to put it up, you can take, you can be much more conservative and leave a fair quantity behind. And what this does is it means you're not only not moving things around to churn it up, but it also will stop you at the point where you will leave much of the material that you want to leave behind. Now, because I'm not going to throw this stuff away, I'm going to keep it at the end. What I do is I compromise and I simply mount this at a right angle like this. And I'm going to leave about four liters behind in this container when we're done for the next dunder. Now, the next issue is water. I don't tend to be too OCD about water. As long as the water tastes okay and it's portable, in general, the strong flavors that we're gonna be adding here are gonna overwhelm any differences in the water. You don't need God's country water in order to do this. The one exception might be that if you're in a municipality where they add a lot of chlorine or bromine to the water to you know, prevent um, the growth of microbes, 
it can affect the ability of some of the sensitive bacteria in the dunder. Uh, it can prevent it from growing. So what I would do is if, if you can't get, say, distilled water or spring water or deionized water, at least fill up your container with the water a few days ahead of time and leave it open. It's not going to remove all of the halogens, but it will reduce them a little bit and improve your odds. Now, because we have a very deep well here with very good quality water, I really don't think about the water. And so my first uh, point is going to be that if we keep this simple, it'll be easy and you'll be likely to do this. So we're going to get into now the process of actually mixing this up. And because we're going to be making a total of 45 liters or 12 gallons, I'm going to fill this about halfway with the water so that we can start adding the other things into it. And then we'll top it off to bring it to the final volume. Last thing before I add the water is temperature. Rum is obviously a tropical drink and it is distilled and it is fermented at high temperatures. So this is going to be a fermentation that we're going to run at around 30 degrees centigrade, nearly 90 degrees Fahrenheit. It's a warm fermentation. The advantage of that is it's going to be fast. Typically, this will be done fermenting in as little as five and generally not more than six days. And so if you're, if you're desperate, rum is a good spirit. So let's go ahead and let's fill this up with some water and get this process started. All right, so that's enough for now. What we're going to do is measure the temperature and see how close we are. It's not critical that you do this at exactly the same temperature and it's going to vary, but at least if we're working sort of along toward 30 degrees, if we know kind of where we are at, we're going to know how much we need to add or subtract with additional water. So not bad, 26 and a half degrees, so we're, we're pretty close. So now the next step is we're going to add the dunder. Now, I'm just going to pour all of it in here. This will obviously cool this off a little bit, but we'll heat that up a little bit later. So we're going to go ahead and throw this in here. Hopefully we don't get any chipmunks or anything else coming out of here. Hmm, marvelous. This makes you want to drink it, doesn't it? Hmm. Now, the next stage is we're going to add yeast nutrient. Now this is probably not that necessary. If you're going to be working with uh, molasses, it has a lot of minerals in it already. But I tend to use this as sort of an insurance policy to make sure the yeast has the best possible environment to grow and to reproduce. And so what this does is it adds nitrogen in the form of urea, synthetic urea, and phosphorus. And the addition of this is very simple, one gram per liter of the final mix. So with 45 liters, I'm going to end up putting in 45 grams of this yeast nutrient, just like that. Now, the next thing we want to do is we want to add the molasses. Now, one of the things that you'll find is that this molasses is incredibly heavy. This is the heaviest liquid I have ever worked with except for mercury. This is less than four liters and weighs nearly six kilograms. There's no way that you're going to confuse this with a bottle of water or alcohol. And we're going to pour this in here like this. Now, as you can see, this stuff is very thick. And it takes a long time to pour this stuff in. You know the old saying, as slow as molasses in January? Well, this is kind of where this came from. And you'll see a lot of people on YouTube when they make rum struggle to get the molasses out of the container because it is so viscous. They'll use scoopers and ladles. But there's a trick. And that is you can take advantage of chemistry and physics. Because if you take a pot of some hot water and you simply put the container in there for about 10 or 15 minutes and heat it up to about body temperature, it becomes much less viscous and pours in much more quickly, as you'll see. Much easier to remove. Now, the final concentration of molasses and water is going to be a 5 to 1 ratio. So if we're adding 2 gallons of molasses, we're going to add 5 gallons of water. Or if we're going to use about 7.5 liters of molasses, we're going to make about 45 liters of final product. Much easier than scooping. 
Now I'm going to warm the other bottle up, and then we're going to add both of these in. Now, something I should have mentioned before, man, that smells good, is that another parallel well, between sake and uh, rum is the fact that sake is intentionally inoculated with aspergillus prior to the fermentation to break down some of the rice and the starch. And that's what gives it that nutty flavor. This isn't done for scotch and bourbon or rye. And it's how bacteria really improve the flavor of these different beverages. Now we're going to go ahead and measure the temperature here because I'm going to top this up to the final 45 liters and I want to add either cool or warm water to try to get me closer to that target. So if I put the meter in here, see where we're at. So we're still on the low side, about 26 degrees. So I'm going to add some pretty warm water here to bring this up and hopefully we'll get pretty close to 30 degrees. All right, as you can see, we're right at about 12 gallons, 45 liters is buried underneath there. Let's take a look at the temperature, Let's see what we get. Very close. So good, we're good to go. Now, the next step is we're gonna go ahead and mix this up. Now, one big advantage when you're dealing with a big container like this is instead of using a big spoon or a stick, I take my Home Depot concrete mixer for about, I don't know, $15, place it in here, and we're gonna turn this around like this, and we're gonna mix. The only thing you have to be a little careful of is that the thermometer on the other side is obviously sticking into the vessel. So I can't get too wacky with how I position this. But this can get some pr pretty powerful <laughs> rotation going. All right, that's pretty decent. Another little trick is you see this white plastic uh, sheet that I have underneath here. That's actually the protection uh, that you put underneath a water heater to keep it from dripping into your house. And it actually makes a nice sticky barrier for any of the things that are going on around so you don't get them on your table. So it's a nice little trick. And then the insulating pad here I placed underneath the vessel just allows us to retain the heat later on when we don't want to pay for it. All right, the next step is to adjust the pH. Rum likes to grow in a slightly acidic environment between about 5.5 and 6 on the pH scale. Now our tap water, our well water, runs at about 7. And so what we're going to have to do is see if we have to adjust the pH to bring it to the right range. And the way to do that is we're going to get a pH meter here and we're going to do an examination of the pH as it exists without any kind of modification. Turn this guy on and take a look at what we've got. Now, as you can see, we've got a pH of about 6.3 here. Now, that's not because of the molasses. It's because of the acidity of the dunder. All the acids that are present have lowered the pH down to about 6.2, 6.3. So to get this a little bit more acidic, to optimize this for the yeast, you've got two choices. One thing you could do is you could simply take some citric acid, take a little scoop of it, put it into the container, mix it up, measure it. But if you don't want to buy the citric acid, another choice would simply be to get, a, to get a lemon. Now, I actually tested this, and it turns out that the lemons that we get here in New England in the winter contain citric acid. And if you add one cc of this lemon juice to one liter of liquid, it lowers the pH by about 1.2 units. So 7 goes to 5.8. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to extract some of the juice here, try to keep most of it in the cup. It doesn't matter if we get seeds here, that's not going to affect the fermentation. But this is a little bit more convenient than say buying a whole bag of citric acid just for this purpose. 
Now, if you figure that we've got 45 liters in here, we're going to need 45 milliliters of this if we wanted to lower the pH a total of 1.2 units. But we're probably close to a half a unit or even a little bit less. And so we probably want to add about 20 milliliters of this lemon juice to the mixture. So because each lemon can vary, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take 10 milliliters, add it in, mix it, and we'll see what kind of adjustment we make in the 6.3 that we already tested. That's 10 ml with a little bit of pulp. We'll put this in here like this. And then we'll get our favorite concrete mixer going again and blend this in. And then we're going to measure the pH. That should do it. I really like this plastic protective anti-sticky guard. It makes cleanup a breeze. So let's go ahead and take our meter and see what we did, if anything, to the pH. Remember, we were at 6.3 before. Now let's look. Not much. So we may need to add substantially more lemon juice. I got a weak lemon here. It's always easy to add. It's hard to subtract. So it's always a good idea to play it safe. So I'm going to put in another 20. And if you don't get there, you get another lemon. All right, let's mix it up and test it again. The smell in here is absolutely fantastic. Now we're going to go ahead and we're going to add or measure the pH and see if we're getting anywhere. So not moving much. But I think I'm going to live with a 6.1 because I don't want to cut up a whole nother lemon just to get it down a little bit more. Now, the second step is measuring the density, because what we need to do is we need to determine about how much alcohol we're going to make and determine an end point for the fermentation. And the way that we do that is by using a hydrometer. Now, what the hydrometer is, is a calibrated float. And the way this works is that we put liquid in here and we're going to suspend the liquid by putting this float into the liquid. The denser the liquid, the higher this will be supported against the gravity that's pulling down in the top part of this, this float. So if we have a very dense liquid, it's going to float very high. If we have a very thin liquid like pure alcohol, it's going to sink all the way to the bottom. And then on here, there are graphs that measure the specific gravity. And then next to those specific gravities are a, an estimate based on the fact that if all that additional specific gravity beyond water were due to a fermentable, a, uh, a fermentable sugar, then what will happen is that's the amount of alcohol that we will generate when all of it is converted. So we're going to take some of the liquid out of here and we're going to add it to this tube or this cylinder, which is going to support this. Along with a seed. It'll add character. That should be enough. Now this will be a little harder to read simply because it's such a dark liquid, but we can kind of read the top, the meniscus where the float is suspended to get kind of an idea of its density. Now if you look, it's kind of midway in this blue. And if I show you what that means is that if you look, that says approximately 1.080. That's the density of this liquid based on the sugar. And if you calculate over from there, if I just look at this, that's almost exactly at 10% alcohol. So if we converted all of the sugar to alcohol, which you won't do, you won't get 100% conversion, you would make approximately a 10% concentration of alcohol in here. 45 liters means you would produce 4.5 liters of 200 proof pure alcohol and substantially more rum. Now, what will happen is as this converts into alcohol, it will become less dense and this will sink lower and lower. This can be used as an endpoint for the fermentation because it will also tell you that when it stops dropping, you're no longer converting sugar. So it also adds the advantage of providing an endpoint. Now, 
In this case, if I was making a beer and not, not doing a sort of distillation at the end, I wouldn't pour this back in. It's generally bad policy to add stuff back into the container. But in this case, I'm really not concerned. I've already added dunder to this, so I'm not really that concerned that I'm gonna be adding some potential contamination from a clean cylinder. Now that we have the pH close and we have the density at 1.080, the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna do the final oxygenation. Because you see, yeast needs oxygen in order to do its initial growth and reproduction. And so by using a lot of turbulence here, putting this a little higher up in the container, we're gonna generate a big vortex and we're gonna, ins we're gonna instill a lot of additional oxygen, make it foam, make it bubble, and put just about as much oxygen in this as we can. Looking for a Kraken to come out of here. Wonderful. The last step is the yeast. Now you can use a variety of yeasts. You can use bread yeasts, you can use um, champagne yeasts and specialty yeasts, and yeasts do make a difference in the flavor. I really find that this yeast that I'm using from Red Star, which is called daddy yeast, it's sort of a generic term which stands for Distiller's Active Dry Yeast, or Daddy Yeast. It's a generic yeast, but it's inexpensive and it actually works very well. It gives a very nice flavor. And the amount of yeast that we're gonna add is approximately one gram per liter. So we're gonna add 45 grams of yeast to this. Now, one way that you can add the yeast is you simply take the 45 grams and you toss it in. In other words, you pitch the yeast. Another way to do this is to use what's called proofing or proving with a V, but the, the term is proof with an F. And what you're basically doing is you want to prove that the yeast that you're gonna throw into $45 worth of molasses and all this effort is active and viable. And the way you do that is pretty simple. You take the yeast and you're going to add it to some of the material that you're going to be using for the distillation. So I'm gonna take this cup and I'm gonna fill this beaker about halfway full or a little bit less with some of this material. And then what we're gonna do is we're going to add to this 45 grams of the dried yeast. So get my little handy dandy scale and my little spoon and you won't be able to see the number, but I'm adding 45. It's actually a fairly large volume. Now you don't need to use this much, but this stuff is cheap. And I like the idea of sort of overwhelming this with a lot of healthy yeast. And so I add 45 grams, but you could certainly get away with a little bit less. This will just get things started a little bit faster. Now we could have pitched it. We're not gonna do that, we're gonna proof it. So I'm gonna add this 45 grams to the mixture that we're gonna be fermenting. And then I'm gonna stir this up vigorously to hydrate the yeast, to get it fully incorporated into the sweet, sticky, warm, nutritious mixture. And then what we're gonna do is wait. Okay. Now I'm gonna go ahead, take this over here, and I'm going to set this up next to a little timer. All right, so let's go ahead. We've obviously proven that we've created the blob and we're gonna go ahead and throw this into the mixture Now the other third option in terms of adding yeast is to do what's called a yeast starter. And in that case, what you can do is you can use a lower quantity of yeast, take the same sort of nutritious mixture and blend it up a couple of days ahead of time to sort of jump start the process. That can economize on yeast, but at this point we've got such a nutritious, thick, sticky, 
warm mixture that I know that this is gonna take off like crazy, so I'm not really concerned about using the starter. So we're just gonna use the proofed yeast. Now one more mixing to get this all blended in here. And a little more oxygen wouldn't hurt. Good. Now, rather quickly over the next few hours, the yeast is going to use the oxygen in order to reproduce and it's going to multiply. So now if we put a lid on top, we're going to deprive the yeast of any fresh oxygen. And within a few hours, it's going to be forced into an anaerobic phase where it begins to convert the sugar into alcohol. And that's a chemical reaction. It's a biological reaction. And any reaction like that, where the entropy increases, it's exothermic. It produces heat. And it produces a lot of heat. Now, you may not notice that if you're doing a small distillation. But once you get to this kind of volume, it actually produces a substantial, a significant amount of heat. And the reason for that is because as you increase the volume, the amount of heat generated is linear. It increases with the volume. But the surface area over which it can lose that heat to the environment does not go up as fast as the volume does. And this can become a real problem in a large scale fermentation because that additional heat that's generated inside of the liquid will increase the rate of the reaction of the yeast, which increases the amount of heat production, which increases the rate of the reaction, and so on, creating a thermal runaway. And the yeast can actually cook itself. So in large distillations or large fermentations, they will actually have cooling coils inside of the vessel to bring the temperature down and keep the temperature at a reasonable level. What we'll find here is that if I do nothing in a 20 degree centigrade room, this vessel will heat up to about 35 degrees by tomorrow morning. At that point, the reaction begins to slow down a little bit. And so then what I do is I add a little bit of insulation. I took some bubble wrap here and made some slices in the bubble wrap to allow me to put a wrap around the outside of the vessel. And I'll do that the next morning. And if I wrap this all the way around here like this, and put it around about two and a half times, fitting it around all the doohickeys that stick off of the side. I can then theoretically just tape this and provide good insulation. But I add another step. Before I tape this down, I actually insert between the insulation and the vessel a little personal heating pad. This is just a few additional watts. And then what I do is I take a temperature controller and place a small thermistor in the vessel down into the liquid like this and jam the stopper in here to hold it in position. And then I will plug the heating pad into the temperature controller and set it to about 30 degrees centigrade. This won't run for the first few days just because of the insulation. But near the end of the distillation, when it's running out of sugar and it begins to cool down, this will switch on and keep the temperature at about 30 degrees for the last day or two, rather than trailing out over a week or 10 days, eating up the last few bits of sugar so that we'll be done a little bit more quickly. And that's pretty much it. We're set to go. Now, at this point, I would normally say, thanks for watching. Please subscribe. But hang on for just a second. Next week, we're going to do the second part of this video. We're going to go ahead and take the liquid out of this vessel. And we're going to move it over to the still to actually make the rum. But we're going to do a little bit of a twist here. We're going to include a gin basket. And what that is is a small cylindrical element that's placed in the output from the still that allows the hot alcohol vapors to pass through it. And any kind of botanicals that you put inside of it will then be infused with that flavor. They call it a gin basket. Because if you put juniper berries and cardamom in it, you will infuse the alcohol and make gin. In our case, what we're going to do is we're going to use one of these types of spices that I have down here, either Madagascar vanilla, cinnamon from Southeast Asia, Sumatran Colombian coffee, or cacao beans from Peru. What we use will depend on your vote. So we're going to associate with this video a poll that will allow people to vote and choose which one of these is the most popular. 
And that is the material that we're gonna actually put in the gin basket and create a flavored rum with next time. Now at this point, I wanna say thank you very much for watching and please subscribe. If you have any questions or you want to make any kind of comments or have suggestions for other videos, put them in the comments below. The comments and the interaction and the subscriptions help the algorithms with YouTube to spread this channel and to promote it. The bigger we get, the more we can afford to buy the type of equipment and the manpower we need in order to make these videos. So it really helps us out. And if you like what we're doing here, you might want to take a look at some of the other videos we've done. We don't just do distillation. We do jet engines and rocket engines and laser beams and plasma and speaker acoustics and even chocolate. So take a look at some of those. You might find them pretty interesting. In any case, I want to say thank you for watching. You have a wonderful evening. Stay safe and we'll see you soon. Now, I don't know if I mentioned to you, but one of the reasons that rum has a lot of similarity to sake in addition to its location and its growth location is the fact that they intentionally inoculate this uh, sake uh, with aspiral jost.